Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Guests, distinguished visitors, cadets, everybody. I'm here to introduce this panel, a distinguished panel to celebrate 30 years of war, literature, and the arts. But first, I'd like your indulgence for a bit of history. Uh, an editor's statement for the first volume of the 1989 uh, edition says, quote, WLA provides a forum in which scholars can exchange ideas and examine intellectual perspectives on war as depicted in fiction, film, painting, or other art forms produced within any, any culture or cultures past or present. That is, any imaginative treatment of the individual or culture in war, before or after. How such, a street, how such a statement and how WLA came about is the story of the Department of English and Fine Arts in the 70s and 80s. At that time, every cadet, here's a lesson for those of you in cadet uniforms, every cadet read the Iliad or the Odyssey, some poetry of the world wars, some Faulkner, a novel such as A Farewell to Arm or Catch-22. In each case, they were taught by a military faculty, a large percentage of whom had uh, been in combat in War II, Korea, or Vietnam. Parenthetically, during the Vietnam War, at any one time, about 25% of the department was deployed in country, including the professor of art, who served as a combat artist. Such a rate of deployment continues uh, to combat areas today for the remaining military faculty. Thus, we had a faculty who explored the effects of war on the individual from their own experiences, and they neither promoted nor glorified war, knowing the complexity and the awfulness and the pain that this most human of enterprises bring. At that time, other journals treated military history, tactics, strategy, or singular campaigns, but rarely considered the individual combatant or the creative work that resulted. To fill that gap, we established WLA, despite, I hate to say this, bureaucratic suspicions that we would be somehow subversive or too expensive, or too temporary. We needed two years of, I would say politely, quiet uh, persuasion, I would say privately, Machiavellian plotting uh, to get approval to overcome those impediments. The first volume, which I had here somewhere. Um, never mind, I misplaced it, I guess. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much, Sean. There's the first volume. Okay. It was a slim, paper-bound edition, including essays on the Vietnam Memorial, Vietnam Correspondence, Gravity's Rainbow, Thomas Mann, The Battle of Hastings and the Song of Roland, and curiously, an essay on the patterns of eating in the Iliad. <laughs> that range and diversity of subject and contributors have been hallmarks of w WLA since its first appearance. Beginning with volume two, 1990, we struck editorial gold when we turned to Donald Anderson to take over the journal. Under his guidance, the journal has grown in size, richness, and quality, but there'll be more about Donald later. Let me turn now to our panel. 
The moderator for the panel today is Sean Curio, a man of many tasks. He serves as fiction editor for WLA and is nonfiction editor of the literary journal Grist, an active duty captain in the Air Force, as you can see. Sean is currently pursuing a PhD in English at the University of Tennessee. Many challenges. Brian Turner is a veteran of seven years service in the US Army, including tours of duty in Iraq and Bosnia. Brian is a poet, essayist, uh, director of Sierra Nevada College's Master of Fine Arts program. He won the 2005 Beatrice Hawley Award for his debut collection, Here, Bullet. Other celebrated books include My Life as a Foreign Country and Phantom Noise. He has been awarded a Lannan Literary Fellowship, an NEA Literature Fellowship, and the Amy Lowell Traveling Scholarship. He earned his MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon. Benjamin Bush um, is a veteran U.S. Marine Corps officer who served two tours in Iraq before becoming a writer, filmmaker, and illustrator. He's the author of the memoir, Dust to Dust. His essays have been published in Harper's, New York Times Magazine, WLA, and featured on NPR. His poems have appeared in North American Review, Prairie Schooner, Fine Points, Michigan Quarterly Review, Epiphany, among others. And, fi and finally, my old friend, Donald Anderson, the editor of War, Literature, and the Arts, is also the author of the books Fire Road, Gathering Noise from My Life, and Below Freezing, among others. A former career officer in the US Air Force and a sometime executive officer when I was department head, a matter we both keep quiet. He now lives in Colorado Springs where as a professor of English, he directs creative writing at the Air Force Academy. He earned his MFA from Cornell University. And with that, Sean. If I, if I could ask Tom Bowie to come up on stage too, please. I know you're out here in the audience somewhere. Oh, behind, thank you, great. Donald, if you'd come forward. So I have a small token of appreciation to present to Donald in honoring the 30 year anniversary of the journal. First and foremost, this is a gift for Alan Anderson to beat Donald if he gets out of line. Okay, it's very heavy and it would hurt him very much. Okay, but on behalf of the permanent professors who have had to bear the burden of you the most, <laughs> and your friends and colleagues in the Department of English and Fine Arts, I'm happy to present this with this inscription. Donald Anderson, editor, War Literature and the Arts, thank you for 30 years of disturbing the status quo and forcing us to view the world anew. As you have often told your students, you get credit. Yeah. Oh. Welcome. Um, today we're going to start with a 30 minute reading uh, from each of our authors. We'll be starting with Brian, moving to Benjamin Bush, and then following with uh, Donald Anderson. And then after that, we're going to have a uh, discussion. 30 minutes total, 30 uh, minutes total right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Total. <laughs> and then we're going to have a discussion, and then uh, hopefully after that, we'll open it up for a little bit of. Q&A. So if we could start with Brian. All right, thank you. Yeah. 
I am a drone aircraft plying the darkness above my body, flying over my wife as she sleeps beside me, over the curvature of the earth, over the glens of Antrim and the Dalmatian coastline, the shelves of Dubrovnik and Birchko and Mosul arcing in the air beside me, projectiles filled with poems and death and love. I am 32,000 feet over the Atlantic seaboard, the fields, the orchards, the woodlands below pressed together the way countries on maps do, coursing waterways, paved roads, and dirt tracks and furrows cutting through. Countries touching countries. Bosnia and Vietnam and Iraq and Northern Ireland and Korea and Russia pressed together in the geography below. Cumulus scattered above them, their shapes authored by sunlight on the ground beneath. The Battle of Guadalcanal emerges from the shadows where my grandfather lives, now Bougainville, Guam, Iwo Jima. Highway 1, Iraq's highway of death, stretches through desert on one side of California San Joaquin Valley and on one side and California San Joaquin Valley on the other. The eucalyptus trees of my childhood line the sides of the highway. In places, I can see the scorch marks on the asphalt where transport trucks were left to burn. My dead uncle Paul steals oranges in the night groves there, just as he did when I was eight years old, while fresh, dark earth covers the newly dead on the other side of the highway. Owls perch on their gravestones, calling out for water. Each night I do this, monitoring heat signatures in the landscape, switching from white hot to black hot lenses as I bank and turn, gathering circuit by circuit the necessary intelligence, all that I have done, all that we have done, compressed in the demarcations of the map below. I think I said Black Hawk signatures. That was Black Hawk, right? Yeah. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Is everybody all right? OK. I see like a whole assembly of the mass, a huge part of our tribe, which has grown so much over these years. Um, and great thanks to WLA and the efforts of the community that's built um, here. Um, and I see Peter Moline there. I was just talking outside, and I think there's been a great synergy in this, in this collaboration between West Point and here. And over the years, um, uh, going to AWP conferences, for example, early on you might see 15 or 20 people getting a beer at the bar. And now that we spill out into the, into, there's no building large enough to hold us, you know? Um, Mosul is inside me. All of its buildings, all of its smoke and pollution, its 1.7 million people, the university district and the bridges over the winding river, barber shops and ice trucks and sheep grazing in the ruins of Nineveh, minarets, water buffalo in the eucalyptus groves where the rotting uniforms of Saddam's military continue to disappear, the dead Canadians out by the television station, the Kurdish Peshmerga standing guard beside sandbagged machine gun emplacements stationed around their regional political office, Old men staring from the automotive shops, the bird-like bodies of their grandchildren chasing after us through the neighborhoods, the ghosts rising from the mist along the river, the slow-moving ghosts in the streets and alleys of Mosul, the many ghosts returning to their homes at night to sleep with the ones they love. Dead tanks rust in the graveyard of metal beyond the outskirts of the city like skeletons in a field. They remind me of images of German and French and British soldiers left on the battlefields of the First World War, their jawbones unhinged, small tufts of hair clinging to the curvature of the skull, the way sawgrass clings to the dunes by the sea, wind blowing through them as through a flute. This is an odd part for a memoir. Some of you who are sort of classical memoirists, um, you don't, you, want, you don't want Bob Dylan to ever plug in. You want him to play acoustic guitar. Um, this is kind of like an electric Bob Dylan. So. so I'm the writer of this book. It's a memoir, but then this happens. Sergeant Turner is dead. I was there when it happened. I climbed back up from inside the troop hole to stand in the hatch as our driver juiced it, and we sped away from the explosion, my head ringing. The multi-story buildings were still standing, brown and drab and without light. The cloud cover remained. And there in the street where the RPG struck, the dead Sergeant Turner stood up, holding his head in his hands as, I di as he did so, swaying in the dust and exhaust fumes. He recedes and diminishes in my field of vision as we drive further and further away. I'll imagine him wandering around the traffic circle when I'm back in my hooch, laying in my rack. 
He walks one of the wide boulevards of Mosul for hours, walking until the boulevard narrows, its meridian replaced with painted lines faded with age and use, walking until the avenue becomes a smaller road, and then the drive shifts to a simple dirt lane, far from the shrapnel and the shouting he came from, so that he might rest on the banks of the Tigris, where the vast assembly of the dead have gathered before him. The dead press their way into the elephant grass and the papyrus thickets, wordless as they wade into the river. The water gives slightly, and they sink for a moment before rising again, buoyant and light, to drift in the shadows just offshore. Seagulls wheel and turn in the air above, crying out from time to time. They see the dead lining the banks and filling the river, hundreds of thousands, perhaps more, as far as the eye can see. And some of the dead pause to watch Sergeant Turner as he makes his way down to the water's edge. He takes off his gloves, unlaces his boots, and sets them beside him. He pulls the Velcro flap on his Kevlar vest and lays it folded by his boots, pulls the chin strap down slightly to slide his helmet off, setting it on the flak vest with its plates of body armor. When he unrolls his boot socks from the ankle downward and off, the faint trace of the breeze cools the pads of his feet. Some of the dead harden their gaze as, they, as Sergeant Turner parts the tall grass and wades into the river. Some of the dead stare off towards the city skyline. Blackhawks fly in tandem, wide tandem circles, their distant rotor blades rolling deep and low over the water like drums. Sergeant Turner leans his head back into the cool gray surface of the river until his ears fully submerge. High winds erase the contrails of fighter jets in the stratosphere above. As he listens to the muted wavelengths of sound, the water carries out to sea. When he rolls his head to the side and looks toward the shore, he sees a small boy crouching there, staring at him. The expression on the boy's face is as gray and reflective as the river. There is something stilled and aged in the boy. And as the boy looks on, Sergeant Turner closes his eyes and sinks under the water's surface. So I think I just killed myself in my own memoir. But there are pages after that, so who knows what's going to happen then. You know? <laughs> right? Um, if you'll indulge me, and with apologies to all who have ever published in WLA. Um, Don, I'm sorry. If I, if I, um, and I think there's children's here, but uh, they just don't listen for a moment. But if, if I fuck this up, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I like being an... In, 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 how many enlisted are here? All right. Shout out for the enlisted. Any enlisted soldiers? Ah, Maurice, all right. So I appreciate all these officers allowing some of the enlisted to walk into this room, you know. And uh, every now and then, a, a word like the F word, we, we share it no, no matter what part of the, the rank structure we fall on, right? Uh, uh, but th none of those words show up in this next piece. In, in fact, none of my words show up in this next piece. And I went from 1989 until the current day, the current issue, and I tried to create from the words that were there a uh, kind of conversation, or listen to a conversation that's already there. So, it is true, first of all, that a reader may recognize small town and working class values like hard work, competition, sacrifice, duty. This is the story of my life. I remember the snowy outline of the North African coasts, the blue Mediterranean winter afternoons, Naples looking murky and sullen, 72 hours of incoming that eventually took out all four of the 105s and dug through the sandbags to blow all the ammo bunkers, the snow falling gently along a trail parallel to a swift river. Sophocles himself could hardly have asked for better material. Through the sepia tones of the cracked photograph, I inherit my father's penchant for orderly collection, my mother's fears. Remember? When it comes to a 50 caliber machine gun, single shots call for technique. Tripod legs, sandbagged, the butterfly switch. Because any bullet that misses will crack the air overhead like a cattle whip. You don't forget what tried to kill you. Don't ask me why. I only know you never know what's going to save you. The inner and outer worlds are problematic and the borderline between them is impermeable. The impending threat called for plans and drills, preparation, but throughout that long process, sometimes an ordeal, I kept one purpose in mind, a kind of literary mission, if you will. There is no metaphor. Birdsong can't float so much death. Requiem cannot bring repose for cries now swelling, bursting to symphony this century of death. Be prepared for morphine drips beeping monitors for doctors who will press a firm hand on your shoulder when there's nothing left to say. What happens to soldiers in wars 
happens also to the rippling circles of those who know or love them. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, lovers, pet dogs, hometowns, nations. Pray to whomever you kneel down to, hawk or wolf or the great whale, record keeper of time before, time now, time ahead, pray. I apologize, noting long deep grooves in the urns tracing trajectories of small arms fire. Go back, reassemble the disassembled, recall head to body, the body still warm, eyes burning with their own historic dynamic. What seems impossible becomes possible, and what seems unreasonable becomes norm. Listen, there is nothing romantic about this. There is a rooftop sniper not far from here, resting the crosshairs, measuring the distance. From the field of his country, the dead rise up now. They walk through fire smoke valleys to cross over water. They gather around. They are as uncountable as fog. The importance of these moments will not be noticeable until they become impossible to find. Cubism, symbolism, abstraction, icons and iconography, photography and photojournalism, portraiture and cave paintings are all referenced in these images. They demonstrate the necessity of artists to find art despite circumstance. Soldiers more than anyone know what they are capable of destroying. And when they write about war, they are working to protect the world. Today, we drive through minefields. We peel off our armor and sit on the floor. That's the face of battle that almost always gets forgotten. I've spent my life trying to learn, as people have pointed out, see in the shadow of death. They are the lessons of life. Arcs and tracers and flares and muzzle flashes, night blossoms planted from a B-52 shaking the earth. I am obsessed by these themes. Dark humor, a gallows laugh in the face of all this horror. As an artist, I want to always be testing myself. My words return in blurred metallic waves as if I'm listening to a distant me reverberate. Fathoms, the darkness, wide. Sunny days, sweeping the clouds away. The air is sweet. Hmm? Much of it is music, you know and I know and love. Birds call with their long whistles that trail off with deeper notes that seem to meditate on the silence of a place still not conquered. When we hear the sound of rotors bouncing off the hills above, neither of us move with any sense of purpose. So, to WLA, thank you. How was the echo? Can we work that out? Right. This is Odin's chamber. Every time I listen to something come up as a word, I imagine it's reverberation. It's got shot right out of that hole at the top of this tower. Heads towards the North Star and bounces back over the universe. Comes back and eventually finds me. And that's how I gain Odin's favor. <laughs> Along with fantastic hair. Thank you all for gathering around our fire. So many of my favorite people are here. And um, this was printed by Lieutenant Macy Miller with her own blood. It's like, you wonder why things run well? It's because someone's holding a conference over their heads. Thank you. Um, I wrote a, uh, a memoir called Dust to Dust. Um, I think in fragments as an artist. We all see and remember in fragments, so I tried to find a way for that to form narrative, like thought does. If nothing comes in a continuous stream, um, at least not for me. And um, there were certain things that prose couldn't do, and I began to sever off uh, pieces, and prose became poems because I could play with structure could emphasize different things. And you know, we're all talking about endings, you know, how much historians love to, to put dates on things, the day the war ends. But what we talk about in world literature and arts all the time, for 30 years you've seen people saying that nothing ends at the end. 
everything is subtext. Even the, uh, even the stuff that we wear um, as clothing. So this is a small poem I'll read with. It's called Subtext. And the first line is in quotes. This is not about that. It is too obvious to write about an occurrence long with disappointment. But it is over. Uneven mud brick walls, burnt plastic wind, diesel exhaust, dust in the sky, children running, the curiosity of goats and men with sticks. Body heavy with bullets, soil thick with bone and bleeding, face rough with salt. The war occurs in everything now. And this is about that. So I began to to find that we were all people before we were in the military service. And we became people after that as well. And we seem to like to compartmentalize as people. It's, it's comfortable. It's, it's, a, it's a way of control, which we all seek in one way or another. And uh, my second tour, I was in Ramadi in 2005. You can look it up. And I left my wife with our first infant. I'd seen little Alexander born, and that was my participation in fatherhood, was departure. Uh, the cruelty of us all abandoning those who love us for our selfless service. And um, in the first tour, I would notice girls, children, mostly because girls were brightly dressed. I could see them for miles uh, in the Iraqi desert. But the second time, I saw them differently. You know, as experience, as we gain experience, we change. We understand things differently. It happens with literature. It happens with all the stories you read. Um, to read something as a parent is different than to read something as, uh, as someone who hasn't brought a child into the world or tried to save one. And so this is a small poem called Girls because, uh, because subtext was involved. The men are not home, gone before we arrived, slipped out into the usual conspiracies, so tired of us smiling and waving, exhausted by our incomprehension. They leave to hide inside their country, aware, always, that we are circling and smiling harder. Their girls are home, waiting along the path of our orbit, expecting us to collide because they have nowhere else to go, weighed with all the inhibition they are taught. Mothers are not fools. It is men, simple with gunfire. Rusting gates are welded from the wreckage of other things, bullet holes punched through, girls peering out, their thin bodies half inside, faces lit in the breach to see beyond the whispers of women. They sweep entryways, separating dust from packed earth as if one were not the other. We pass because we must, slow and reptilian, unable to pretend we mean no harm. This is no man's land. Here in a business of flies, where a baby stumbles into fatherless space, smiling because she does not know us, and the war ends. So I don't write that many poems which anyone would consider war poems, at least not on the surface, at least if they haven't read my memoir or know me and know the know what I'm doing, uh, but I'll read one which is openly about that before I return to the subterrain where I usually dwell. I'm actually staying in Jesse Goolsby's cellar while I'm here. It's the most comfortable cellar I've ever been in, but I'm glad he knew to keep me underground. It's called Full Bleed. We don't own it but we have to keep just enough, a gallon and a half. Worry when we see it run. 
will say, that's my blood. Though we really can't tell one man's blood from another's. That's blood, we say, and we'll pause, looking down, amazed, bright on bandages, and we'll drop what we're doing, pay attention, seal the drip that goes all the way to our hearts, everyone telling us to stay calm. He was calm, ripped open quiet, the air hard, tore holes blood couldn't imagine on my hand, my boots. This blood has been in the tips of his fingers, close enough to touch, warmed by the sun. Summers in Maine, summers in the war. This blood has been in his mind, passed through, never knew what he thought. We don't mention the intimacy of blood, but here in the streets when it spills out like this, drained from wounds it can't seal, I can feel his blood trying to put a scab on me instead. Blood tries to save everyone. This is a full bleed, given to insects and soil, and given to me. A new way to see myself, and I don't know what to do. The metals rusting on my arm, armor forming one color thick, thinner than dust, cracking in my palm. Here's where I split apart, along these lifelines, blood cracking these dry palm trees. Did you know blood could crack? This is his. I'll have to wash it off to make sure he's gone. I live in Michigan now. I grew up in upstate New York. And uh, I've been t told many people that Michigan is where excitement goes to die. But I live on a farm, uh, which is a wreckage of other people's ambitions, uh, their failure, now my own. And um, it's got a lot of green space around it. And we moved there right after I got back from my tour. My wife, uh, a wiser individual, a professor, got the only job that a historian could get in the country, Michigan at the time. And we stay there still. But I've always been around deer hunters, whether upstate New York or Michigan. And so, Remember subtext. This is just about deer hunting. The morning is filled with killing. Trucks creep in slow swerve the dirt roads, search for herds as if all the land were suddenly theirs. Look away when I stand in the yard, insulted by my claim. Long cracks of rifle fire crawling over the low hills, the first bullets of winter, and all the animals seem to know that the sky is too clear for thunder, all the geese gone. They have learned this about us, how during one night we change into predators, hang gashed bodies in garages and from trees for all to see, cut them open on opening day. Subtext. And this one um, is truly about my dog. And also about so many other things. And I've had people who love dogs have sent me nice notes about this poem. And a lot of veterans have sent me poem, uh, messages about this poem. And they don't have dogs. Maybe you'll figure this one. <laughs> it's called Dog Trail. This is about my home in upstate New York, which has a hill behind it. On our hill, there was a trail to the moon. Our black dog found it, beat it into the ground with his paws. It could be supposed that he hated moons, that his ferocity was more than dutiful, but we'll never know. At night, he would run, hackles up, furious in a line to the grass to join the darkness at the crest where the moon was found again, not to be resting, but higher still in the sky where he had driven it, bright and silent, above the night echo of warnings barked hard and serious. Years of this. Even when he was old and groaned as he rose from the floor, he would summon his fury and run at the sky. When he died, we walked the ashes up his path, left them as close to the moon as any of us could get, 
dog burned off, black as he ever was, a Labrador the color of crows, spread out into grass growing back, his mark on the hillside fading, filling in those thousands of nights he labored his voice into space, yelled to himself as he ran, defend the house, defend the house, be fearless and savage, stop at nothing at the top of the earth. And to the moon, you are too close to what is mine. Good dog. All he needed to hear for a lifetime of soldiering. I'm reluctant to uh, leave my piece of the terrazzo over there. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, for years here, I've taught war literature, and for the longest time, I taught Vietnam War literature because it was the war of my generation. It was the war literature I knew best. A couple years back, I awakened one morning to realize that I had been born closer to World War I than my students had been born close to Vietnam. So I started teaching Iraq and Afghanistan. But a lot of that has to do with uh, having met and become friends with uh, Benjamin and Brian. I'm flanked by war literature. Uh, at one point, Sean, in his generosity, uh, wanted us to read only from stuff that had appeared in, in uh, WLA, but you didn't come to hear Brian and Benjamin read somebody else's work. Uh, and I'm grateful that you came. I feel wingmanned up. I do. Um, someone unkindly pointed out to me a while back that I am one year older than the Air Force. <laughs> Having been born in 1946, one consequence of armistice. Uh, okay, but as long as we're thinking about ancient days and subtext, let me take you back to 1962 when I was a sophomore in high school. And in 1962, I had a plan that I presented at dinner time. My plan was to drop out of high school and go to work in a car wash so that I could buy a car to wash. <laughs> and I presented this plan, and then my father presented his plan, which went something like this. Listen up, it for brains. <laughs> You're going to at least finish high school. And when that's done, I'll help you get a job in the mines, and you can work on that 1947 Pontiac Silver Streak you have your eye on. We'll see how that works out for you. And so I was thinking about that the other, the other day. I'm working on a new book manuscript, and I started to write something that turned into something else, Benjamin. During the 60s, at 18, I signed up for the selective service. I'd also waited until the required 18 to work underground in the Anaconda Company copper mines in my hometown of Butte, Montana. On my first day at the mines, I stood at the head frame in my clean clothes and hard hat, my rubber steel-toed boots, my gloves were clean. If only I'd scratched my hard hat with a rock or screwdriver before presenting myself before the experienced miners whom, with whom I waited for the hoist cage to be lowered into the earth. This first day, I was dropped 5200 to the 5200 level, one mile deep, at the Mount Con mine. The mine wasn't named as a prison. Kahn was the first name of one of Butte's first mining superintendents. 
I don't know what he was famous for. Butte, Montana, richest hill on earth, was once famous for being the largest city between St. Louis and Seattle. In 1867, the peak of the Placer boom had the city's population at 500. It halved over the next two years. Then quartz deposits were discovered, based first on silver, then copper. Mining barons became Montana's first millionaires. In 1884, there were 300 operating mines, 4,000 posted mining claims, nine quartz mills, and four smelters, all operating 24-7, making Butte the planet's largest producer of copper. In 1899, Marcus Daly merged with Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company to create the Amalgamated Copper Mining Company. By 1910, having bought up the smaller mining companies, Amalgamated changed its name to the Andaconda Copper Mining Company, the largest corporate power in Montana. Early in my first shift, during some shovel and pick work, one of the older crew tapped my shoulder. Slow the f down, college boy. You're making us look bad. I hadn't yet started college, but I slowed the f down. And it wasn't many days until my clothes were as dirty as anyone's around me. I planned to work a few months to save money for school and mostly to buy a car. I worked three months and started attending the Montana School of Mines after Labor Day. I either walked to school or had my father drop me off on his way to his work in the mines. On and off during the school year, on weekends and holidays, I worked underground for what was the town's best pay, $21 a day. I got assigned to clear grizzlies, a greenhorn's job. The grizzlies lit at a hundred foot shaft with a grid of spaced iron bars like railroad rails. There was enough room between the rails to fall through, which was why it was a rule to wear a safety belt connected by rope to a rock bolt, or had been mucked into the smaller shaft called a raise to tumble by gravity from mining above the grizzlies below. This happened on each level of the mine. If ore didn't fit between rails, it was my job to break it into suitable size with a double jack, a sledge with a head weighing in at 20 or so pounds, and forged from heat-treated high-carbon steel. The two rounded striking faces minimized chipping and provided blunt force. Sometimes the ore was just too dense to break with the hammer, and you would resort to dynamite. All this to reduce the mine door to a size that would fit between the rails, and thus into a motor car to be taken to the main shaft to be hoisted to the surface. My education in dynamite was, one, pack a stick or two onto the block of ore with handfuls of mud. Two, insert an electric blasting cap into one of the sticks. Three, run out your wires until you could find what felt to you to be ad adequate cover. Four, expose the wires to the terminals of your wet cell battery that powered your headlamp and attend the immediate blast. Before touching the wire, shouting fire on the grizzlies, if you couldn't then break the ore, you repeated the process using additional sticks. I once used six sticks and nearly blew the place up. The blast rattled my teeth and rib cage. It pushed on the air in my lungs. In the time it took for the concussed dust to settle, I worried I'd loosened the grid 
I double-checked my safety belt before stepping onto the Grizzlies, where with a steel pry bar, I maneuvered the broken oar to fall betwixt the rails. Thereafter assigned to the Grizzlies, I never exceeded four sticks. I had no notion then, and none now, as to why the grid of spaced iron bars is called Grizzlies. I found no explanation online, only confirmation of the term grizzly. What I did know is that the ore the size of a hay bale can weigh as much as your car and is hard to disassemble with a hammer. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima was the equivalent of 12 to 15,000 tons of TNT which would terrify you if you knew what six sticks would do. The largest bomb in the service in the U.S. Nu nuclear arsenal has a yield of 1.2 megatons. A megaton is a unit of explosive power equivalent to one million tons of TNT. I worked in the mines on and off during the first years of the war in Vietnam. I was told that the copper being mined was being used mostly as shell casings for that war. I've wondered if that were true. It could be. Years after my stint in the mines, I managed to buy my first car, a 1970 Chevrolet Chevelle, two-door two-tone gold and white, which I purchased using my Air Force orders as collateral. I drove it from Salt Lake City to Biloxi, Mississippi, where within the month I took it to Sears to have it retrofitted for air conditioning. Hands down, the best money I ever spent. <laughs> Butte, Montana still holds the record for the lowest recorded temperature in the contiguous United States, minus 61 degrees Fahrenheit. I showed up in Biloxi Air Force Base on Bastille Day, July 14, 1971. Immediate first thought, why had we fought for the South? Have you been to Mississippi? <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> Castle Bravo, the largest nuclear weapon detonated by the United States, set off at Bikini on February 28, 1954, produced twice the energy expected from 8 million tons of TNT an explosion equivalent to some 15 million tons of TNT. It's common knowledge, isn't it, that the prizes Alfred Nobel funded, benefiting science, culture, and peace, were and are made possible by his manufacture and sale of TNT. The world's most powerful hydrogen bomb detonated on October 30th, 1961, over Novoya Semla in the Soviet Union. The bomb had the explosive force of 58 megatons, 6,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, dropped by an aircraft and detonated 1,200 feet above the Earth's surface. The shock wave circled the planet three times, the mushroom cloud extending 38 miles into the atmosphere. The Soviets labeled their experience Tsar Bomba. Tsar can be translated as Russian emperor, tyrant, or somebody in authority. Alfred Nobel's father manufactured land mines. There were crates of dynamite and blasting caps scattered throughout the mine I worked in. The amounts were restocked constantly, like an armory for munitions training. What I think of now is that a blasting cap, never mind a dynamite stick, is enough to blow your hands off. 
how was I permitted use? I was a teenager in a hard hat. I felt conscripted, ready for deployment. Thank you all for your wonderful readings. Um, and now I would like to have a discussion with all three of you, um, primarily about what you think the importance of war literature is now and moving forward. So any of you can take that. Um, yeah, uh, so a couple of you might have heard me say something along these lines in response. I, I think it's important for, for our country, which is actively engaged in multiple wars, around the globe, and, and some could argue here at home too, right? And um, for the most part, for me, it seems like I don't see much talk about it. I don't see much conversation. It's very active in some places, but um, like the word peace, um, I haven't heard a politician use that word in um, uh, years. You know? It'd be interesting to see as this campaign, we only have a month before the midterms, and there's only a little bit of time left to say those words. <laughs> I, mean, I laugh out of just out of horror, you know. And it's like because we can't conceptualize it. It's become part of, and I've said this oftentimes. It's become part of our autonomic nervous system to just conduct war as a nation. And um, I don't have to think about my heartbeat, and I don't have to think about breathing. But if you plunge my head underwater, I'm going to start thinking about breathing pretty quickly. And I don't know what it's going to take to plunge this nation's head underwater and start thinking about the wars that uh, many people here have to. Uh, be in close contact with, you know. Yeah, when we um, when we were full blown in Iraq and Afghanistan and mm. dicking around in Libya, uh, everybody's Netflix still showed up on time, mm. and that bothers me. Mm. Well, as a filmmaker, I'd like a different example. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm glad you had to, you know, sit in a pit, look up out of a hole, holding a 20-pound hammer, because that pleased that makes you both feel Odin better. and Thor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I worry always about our relationship to consequence and how far we seem to be pushing ourselves away just as a, as a people. And that consequence is desperate for articulation. It has to have some sense of familiarity. And, um, you know, how many people claim to believe and follow the Bible? How long has that text been around? What is, it, what is its necessity? It's, it's a war journal. It's the first war literature in the arts. It's full of wreckage, of, of fear, of, um, of us in conflict with each other and being punished for it or rewarded. How many people have gone forward to die for a story? Who still do? What is the story? What's the power of that story? And of, of all the religious texts, um, well, not the Buddhist arms, so, but you know, there's, there's the idea of that being embedded into human culture. And I always look at the, the caves in France and you know, it's the first time man identified themselves as having a, an identity. And the next thing they gave themselves was a spear and an animal to hunt. And then they were hunting each other. And that's the first written record we have. That's how we evolved. Um, so I, I, find it, I, fi I find it one of the most important of our conversations. What are we willing to kill each other for? How can we talk ourselves out of that? It's gonna require language. It's gonna require a comprehension of consequence. It's gonna require the stories of those who participated from everywhere up. And I you know we talk about the combat veteran, and I've, I've talked about this with some of you before, but you know, the idea that that seems to be eating the narrative and sucking the air out of the bombs, but uh, but as a, as a small example, I was talking to a, a young woman who didn't think she was part of the narrative. Uh, I met her at a, you know, some collateral veteran casual gathering of people, 
And um, she said she only had one, one photograph of her service. And she's sitting on a bomb in some, you know, ammo supply point in the U.S., never deployed, just went to training and did this, and then went home, moved on with her life. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but be like, <laughs> think about all the things that you're sitting on. You know, the mine that the metal came from, the apportionment of funds for that, the vote to send it someplace, the idea that we chose to turn somebody into dead with that one thing that you're sitting on, that you're part of as its movement to damage. Um, we're all related to it. Uh, just the simple fact that you're a citizen, if you pay your taxes. So I think that you know, Warlord Chiaras for 30 years was really first in saying, this is an important discussion, and by damn, we're gonna be serious about it. And it's a, not just a discussion which has a, you know, a principal focal point. It allows for expansion. You know, there's a lot of air in a war, and that bomb that was dropped, the shock wave went around the world three times. It didn't hit any of us, except it hit all of us. And that's the fact that, you know, there's one atmosphere. We're, we're, we're breathing plumes of bombs right now that are being dropped from Vegas by the Air Force on someone. And it just keeps circling until it settles. Uh, so I think that's really important. I think this whole discussion and everyone who participates in the telling of these stories, the, the idea that we relate to one another uh, most directly and, and very often incredibly intimately is, is the fact that, you know, we share a set of words and we try to make sense. I was just going to say two points. Um, you talking about putting our head under water and when are we going to start breathing or realizing that we're not breathing and then sort of closing the distance for consequence. Isn't that your job as an artist to relay that to me mm -hmm. about consequence? So... Are you guys doing your job? A lot of, peop a lot of people are doing their job. Uh, we, only ex we, we accept less than 10% of the material sent to us. And uh, in recent years, the, the journal is averaging like 700 pages an issue, and sometimes 1,000. One time, t 1,200 we counted up yeah, one time. Yeah, it's amazing. People are sending material because they're thinking about it. And in some ways, the journal makes me hopeful because people are th thinking about it. So I... And yeah, how, the, how many are reading per month? It was an, oh, how many yeah, well, I, I need to shout out, is Bill Newmiller here? Is he not even in here? Is he? Down. Oh, there, oh, there he is. <laughs> he refuses to, uh, to volunteer his hand. <laughs> 20, tw 20 years ago, New Miller came to me and he said, uh, we gotta, we got to be digital. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> We're book men. <laughs> book men. No. And it, it took me about 10 years, and he finally talked me into it. And about six years ago, we, uh, we stopped printing altogether. And in the last 12 months, more than 2 million pages have been downloaded from War Literature and the Arts website. For free. For free. So, uh, those contributors who always write to me and say, can I get my print copy? No. <laughs> but fear not. People are aware of what you're doing. and. Uh, Without Bill, uh, this never would have happened. So I, we're working on it <laughs> as best we can. I think to get to part of the question, too, I, I, I try, I don't, and I get versions of the truth out of myself, you know, part, portions of it. Yeah. Um, but I think artists in general, it, it's incumbent upon us to try to. Um, to, to challenge ourselves, find something that's disturbing in, inside of us and then share that. And then oftentimes maybe to find home in, some, in the reader or another writer too. You know? So I, I try not to go up there. I come from a line of preachers and you get one of those things in front of me and I can pound on it and start preaching easily <laughs> enough. But 
I'm not learning anything in that process, you know, not much, you know, so. Yeah, and to add to that, I mean, um, how many stories um, orbit around no problem? <laughs> like, this is a story about nothing wrong, really. I mean, <laughs> even the Grinch has issues, you know. It's, there's the idea that the, we, the, our greatest problem is, is probably, you know, warfare on some level, but also uh, all its tributaries, you know, all the things that, that make us angry creatures. And how many other creatures just get pissed and kill other stuff? You know, they're hungry, that I understand. But just like, that gazelle, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I'm not even going to eat it. You know, it's, it's all about that, that idea where we're circling something where we're, we, we imagine is not just our own problem. You know, someone else is going to, is going to relate, you know, in their own unique way to it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I, I write war stories. I, I, I write childhood stories, you know, growing up and maturing into a larger awareness of the same small things I've always been staring at. I'm a stonemason. I stare at rocks all the time. I like your rock. Yeah. It's a good call. <laughs> I didn't get a rock, so. <laughs> so I just, I think that those, those things become amplified as you begin to see how they widen. You know, I'm a, I'm a cartographer. I've been making maps since I was little. Then the military gave me maps and said maps are important. I was like, oh, like I don't know. You know the, so that becomes about journey. And we all have one. It's a pretty good trajectory. Um, so far, I've proved my immort immortality. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to disprove that. I hope I'm not there when it happens. But you know, there's that interesting thing about you know what what, what is the what is the purpose of of conversation and discussion? If you listen to most people anywhere you are, they're complaining about the price of something, the inconvenience of something, their children, their parents. They're not talking like, wow, it's such a beautiful day. Everything's great. My life is so wonderful. Everything's turning out just, I, I, actually, I have nothing to talk about except how great things are. You know, I, I don't want to read that story. I'll send that card to someone on a birthday, but I'll still write something snide on it. So, you know, that's, you know, war's a problem. Fighting's a problem. And all the things which, which build us into that point where we say, all right, now we're dropping bodies. That's it. No more talking. We're now in the land of incomprehension willfully. That's an interesting thing to consider. And that a population is waiting for Netflix while it happens and says, oh, well, that's too bad. I have a question for the two of you. Uh, how do you manage to write so beautifully about war? Because you're both good at that. How do you? What is that about? Writing beautifully about this, this is where we're supposed to do autopsies of ourselves and figure yes. out what's going on inside. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we fight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you, I know you've all read these these guys. I, what is that about? I, because you're writing beautifully about ugly things. One of the things I, I'm not sure if I can answer what it's about, but one of the things I worry about sometimes, a little bit, but is because uh, you know the tradition of war literature over the centuries, some of it, and knowing that that can beguile, that can, there's a romantic impulse of people can, uh, when I was seven, I saw movies and I, I had stories and access to them, and I, I, there's a part of me that learned that that's part of the construction of me in the future is that, I wouldn't go to those wars, but there would be battlefields that, that would be my, in my generation, in my time. And, and if I didn't go, then there's something I wouldn't learn from them, mm -hmm. right? That that was a, a site of meaning. Um, so if I perpetuate that by the things I write, then I'm, then I'm participating in a pathology, right? Or a pathological sort of system. I'm, I'm sharing an illness and helping it continue or something, you know? So I worry about that because I, yeah. I'm, I, I'm pulled by beautiful images myself, regardless of what the, the theme or the subject matter might be. But with, when it has to do with violence and conflict, the taking of people's lives and, 
there is this troubling part of it. But at the same time, I, I, this part of this immortality thing, right? I mean, we have the gods of literature that have come before us, and, and the mountain is high, and to write a sentence, just one sentence, beautifully, like that's part of the charter of being a writer. Like, I, we're all songbirds, and so if you're going to sing, then you have to sing in a way that it might be as beautiful as you can make it. That's, that's and, a line from the Iliad, isn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's it's a line from the 80s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hair bands are in, in, in me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, and just to mess with everybody, uh, Brian wrote my memoir and I wrote his, so, <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to, to skew genre. <laughs> but to going back to, you know, to what you were talking about, you know, it's, that's, that's the sentence we're striving for, mm -hmm. and there's no more beaten language anywhere on earth, and it, I, I wish I could show you my drafts. I, I did that from one of my workshops once, because they're all like, ah, because I was like, you know, take, take this and condense it down to a thousand words of something, you know, and they came in with their thousand word piece. I said, great, uh, make it 500 words. And like, <laughs> you know, like, next night they came back and 500 words, said, great, read that out, it's beautiful. Make it 250 words. We're gonna find what this is about. And they were like, I hate you so much. I'm like, great, that makes me an editor. And you're gonna hate us all, you know, and, and I'm not an editor, but, um, but I, I think I, I do it because I despise disappearance. I hate erasure. I, um, you know, I write about the discovery of ruin because I'm looking for it. I'm looking for, you know, for some way to reverse damage. Um, but I'm also participatory. I joined the Marines not to learn to sew. You know, <laughs> I knew what we did. Uh, I was a studio art major at Vassar College making prints and sculpture. And then I was an infantry officer, you know, which makes me qualified to describe landscape, i.e. terrain. And uh, I just, I, I have an urge to preserve pieces. I write in fragments the same way. And, and, I, and if you look at Donald Anderson's work, it's he's curating pieces that he has noticed. And I think being great observers is the most important thing to a writer, to a, just a human. You know, notice things. We're all in such a damn hurry to die, you know? Uh, and I think we go past things which we forget are, are filled with, you know, with memory. Like if I see, I talk about sometimes my, my, if I see daffodils somewhere, it's always because my mother planted them when I was little. She planted daffodils, and they're still growing at houses we don't live in, everywhere, because they're perennial. I only plant perennials. Go ahead and catch me planting an annual and say, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what happens next year, right? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you know? It's like planting a doll and calling it your child. So I, 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 I look for that kind of stuff, and Donald Anderson, his whole, all his work is is this collection of, of like, I noticed that, I noticed that, and because he thinks thematically often, you know, he's thinking about cold, his new book, which just came out on Saturday, is, is that, that's good. And here's something I remember because maybe of that, of my own, and then that's good. And he did it with gathering noise, because that's what it is. And Brian did it with, uh, we've done it lots of different ways, but these, you know, these pieces, um, you find them, you find a, you find a connection. And I think it's, it's a tough job, because our, my work area looks like a debris field. This looks like someone tipped a library upside down, shook everything out of it, threw a shredder. <laughs> and it's like, okay, make a book out of what's, you know, find the book in here. I'm like, eh. I'm, but it's because I notice those little things. And uh, if we just stop for a moment and let the memory come instead of hurrying by and sort of letting those moments flash, like, ah, mom, store's closing soon. Let, let those moments hang for a bit in your life. Well, uh, speaking of the <laughs> store closing soon, we've got about 10 minutes left. So if we could open it up for questions. Mike's on the side.
We were a bust. <laughs> thank you all, by the way. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Air Force Academy. Everyone who's uh, decided to make language important. Thank you, English departments. <laughs> You're making my job even more useful. Dave, coming down here. <laughs> yeah, we've got a question. I can jump in real quick. If the, um, I'll just riff, and I probably won't answer your question, but there's a few things that come to mind quickly, which is um, I wish sometimes with the fragments, um, I wish sometimes, because when they're at home and they've been cut up in pieces and you have these fragments laid out on your floor or on a desk or something, uh, we read from left to right in English, you know, letter by letter, typed out, word by word, a space, another word, type, 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 space, word. It, it, we read like that and then flip the page and continue. But um, I wish the fragments, because I can see them in my mind's eye, if you could sort of, if, a, if a, we as people could somehow just sort of take in three at one time. And then, but we don't, right? And, um, but we're, you know, we're at multiple time zones. So like you, you've come from, Paris, from um, uh, Lyon, yeah, right? And so part of you must be thinking about your kid, your children, your family back home, and your husband and stuff. Or you, you didn't really, I, if you've seen her face, she was like, Oh, yeah, see, she wasn't thinking anything about that. <laughs> but, but anyway, but, you know, sometimes I think about, I'll think about things that happened last week, and where I'm here right now, but I'm also thinking about things that happened next week, and they're all sort of blended, and we've, we move through time, you know, and sometimes those times layer over each other as well. And so, so when someone says, you know, why'd you join the Army, for example, that's, uh, that's an impossible question, and someone, you know, like, how far back do we have to go? Like, I haven't done enough of the family research to figure out what's in this, these cells that comprise me. Um, so, like, when you said Guadalcanal and the daffodils, you know, that, that gets to that gesture, too, right, of um, the past that's all layered together. If you shear a mountain away, then you can see, or if you can take that, that mine shaft and then just cut away the earth and just see the shaft... It's in a half of it, and see, you know, as, as Don's, you know, descending down into the earth, you can see the geologic history that he's inside a part of, you know. And um, so again, I wish there was another way for us to really get the fragments in the way that they're felt, you know, where, where you can experience a moment. If you had that moment where you smell something, and you're smelling it in that moment, but 1974 is there. And yeah. you're not even sure exactly if it's something from 74, but I'm not, I can't quite name it. But it's there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I tell my students, not only do I have more money than they do, <laughs> but that my life is way richer. And it's because I've read more. And I believe deep in my bones we are where we've been and what we've read. And Benjamin's on to my, my trick. Everything reminds me of something else. And I believe literature, a good definition for literature, are words that are worth repeating. Yeah, and as far as time, um, you know, I love having air superiority, so also thank you for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> good to own the atmosphere. However, we're going to have a space for us which kind of trumps you. <laughs> I think we should also, right here, agree to start uh, a time force. Because if we can be masters of time and space, who can touch us? Yeah. But I just don't, we don't think chronologically. We don't dream chronologically. 
We just don't. You know, as, you, as memories come to you, they're out of order because your, your brain is onto something. It gets onto a run. And as an artist, you know, I, I, I look at some of my old work as just, you know, my drawings and drafts and things like that. And um, I make a lot of mistakes. I'm constantly disappointed, as all good artists are. Right? <laughs> I constantly hate my own, uh, my own efforts. But I can see, like in drafts, much like my writing, so like, well, that's terrible. Yeah, that's a little less worse. And yeah, that's profoundly bad still. And, but I, you know, I keep on saving this sentence. Hmm. And sometimes I just, I drop it, and I come back three years later because that sentence is suddenly like everything. Like, ah, I was waiting for this to have its moment. I was waiting for it to finally arrive. I was waiting for it to be important because I didn't have the experience that needed, you know, the, the, the chemical reaction couldn't happen without this atom. I just didn't have it. And, um, and so I think, you know, that, that sense of chronologi uh, chronological order is nice for learning. You know, the system uh, systemized, like, okay, this, this leads to this. We like progression. Uh, and, and we sometimes don't think of disorder as progression, whereas I do. Something might have occurred to me now, which finally makes sense of me at seven, or me in a mine, <laughs> uh, which I've dug many mines, all of them to find nothing. But the effort was there. So it's that the sense that, um, that it, it takes time to, to figure some, some things out. We talked about that with war literature. Like, okay, well, why, why aren't there books you know, after Vietnam immediately? It was a very a good long time before novels really started to happen and memoirs, uh, not just because of reception, because people were sorting things out. They needed to walk in fields. They needed to go find other journeys to find that information. And so I think that, that you know, time is a, is a huge issue. And why do we write sometimes out of sequence? We're not. You know, it takes this thing to this thing to this thing. And I'm, back to the art, you know, I find that the pieces of art that I, I made become irrelevant to the final piece, to anyone who sees it. I finally did the thing I meant to do. No one knows how I got there because I destroyed the evidence. But it was because I was working my way toward the right thing. The thinking was all, you know, I, if you looked at all my work, you can see that, yes, the answer is 24, but I show my work in all the, in all the scrap paper. So I don't know if that's an answer or not. So we actually have to uh, stop right now. Um, but if you would like to continue the conversation with uh, Ben and Brian, they'll be having a book signing um, just over in A-Hall. Um, so with that, uh, if we could thank all of our panelists for this wonderful discussion. I, I would. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have one last thing. One thing is I'd like to make sure um, Don's new book is there. I just saw it today, so it's just it's the first time ah, to see it. So. All right. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you Thank you all. Much.